respected uh, faculty members uh, dear colleagues and guests a very good afternoon to all of you i welcome you all to the inaugural session of the policy talks series of the pg ppm 2020 course today i am happy to inform you all that on this inaugural day we have an eminent personality who is an economist academician and policy maker i feel proud to introduce shri nk singh currently chairman of the 15th finance commission of india for today's lecture sir on behalf of the institute i am bangalore i extend sincere and warm welcome to this talk series so before beginning the speech i would like to highlight upon few of the achievements of shri nk singh sir before joining indian administrative service in 1964 shri nk singh taught economics as a regular faculty member at st stephen's college delhi sir had a long and distinguished career as a member of indian administrative service before his entry into politics and fiscal policy leadership he has served as secretary economic affairs expenditure secretary revenue secretary secretary to the prime minister of india he has been part of the core group of advisors and strategists during the india's economic reforms of 1991 and he has been part of the member of the erstwhile planning commission too as revenue secretary sir oversaw the dream budget of 97 98 which is said to be one of the most ambitious tax reforms so far Shri N K Singh joined politics and served as a member of the upper house of parliament from 2008 to 2014. Later, he presided as chairman of the fiscal responsibility and budget maintenance management review committee. Mr. Singh is a recipient of the Order of the Rising Sun Gold and Silver Award in 2016, which is Japan's second highest civilian award. according to people with distinguished achievements in the field of international relations on the academic front sir is a member of the governing board of the nalanda university and chairperson of its endomentum sir has been a recurring guest lecturer at prestigious academic institutions and like columbia yale stanford and the london school of economics sir is also published author with uh, has, has also published various books like politics of change which provides insight into the realities of coalition politics and interpretation sir has written but not by reason alone sir comments on the past and the present of the politics of change sir has also the new bihar rekindling governance and development which is a collection of perceptive essays on the bihar model of development he has been a reputed columnist yeah, yeah. in indian newspapers like hindu times indian express hindu and print sir is currently working on his autobiography which is likely to be published in december at all for his 40 years of engagement in policy making I will now request sir to start his lecture and enlighten us with the issue of federalism which has gained relevance in view of the current covid pandemic sir we all are eager to learn and enrich ourselves from your rich experiences on public policy and also want to know your views on the changes in the fiscal federalism in the near future due to the current pandemic i would uh, request uh, all the participants to post their queries in the chat box during the session uh, the queries will be taken up in the uh, question answer session at the end of the lecture and before we continue uh, let me at the outset thank you for this opportunity to speak to this prestigious institution 
the IIM in Bangalore with a very distinguished and very exciting Adam yes, yes, and those who have participated in a special program. I value this opportunity to engage with IIM Bangalore at this rather inflection point in our fiscal policy. It's an inflection point because I do not know the memory of uh, any of you, but certainly in my lifetime, my generation, maybe perhaps even in the previous generation, this is the first global pandemic. Not many of us have any memory of the Earth, commonly known as the Spanish flu, which came much earlier. And before that, the bubonic plague, which had afflicted parts of the world. Therefore, in recent human memory, this is the first pandemic the full-blown scale of the country and having to travel. So like in other walks of life, in the overall fiscal framework too, we need to reset the button. What does resetting fiscal architecture mean in pandemic times? To give you some idea of what I call the reset button on the fiscal architecture, I will divide my lecture into two parts. In part one, the evolution of fiscal federalism in India. And the second part of the lecture, dealing with some of the contemporary challenges, particularly the challenge the lessons we need to learn and the implications we have for the overall fiscal federal architecture. As we all know, and many of you would be aware, that the term fiscal federalism was introduced by the German-born American economist Richard Musgrave in 1959. According to William O. <laughs> on fiscal federalism said, quote, it is concerned with understanding which functions and instruments are best central and which are best played in the sphere of decentralized levels of government. The concept applies to all forms of government, military, federal, and confederal, I unquote. The evolution of, of Indian fiscal federalism thus has a very long genesis. It primarily dates back to the Government of India Act of 1919 and the Government of India Act of 1935. While the Act of 1919 provided for the separation of revenue heads between the centre and the provinces, the 1935 Act allowed for the sharing of central revenues and for the provinces to be given grants and aid to carry on the gainful economic activity. The Government of India Act of 1935 went a step further, established the basic structure of fiscal federalism in India, the one that survives today, and which I will describe in short in a little in the first part of our lecture. As we all know, Article 1 of the Constitution of India describes India as Bharat, as a union of states, rather than a federation of states. Now, this is significant. Union, not a federation. Why? This is because the union described in the constitution, in, which is the federal structure, on November the 4th, 1948, the drafter of the constitution, the famous B.R. Ambedkar, addressing the India's Constituent Assembly at that time said, 
a union is not a federation of states. He said that, quote, the drafting committee want to make it clear that although India was to be a federation, federation was not built on an agreement by the states to join the federation. And that federalism is not being the result of an agreement. No state has a right to secede from it. Federation is a union because it is indestructible. Political scientists like uh, Alfred Stephen described India as holding together as against coming together. Unlike the federal form of government in the United States, which is described as an indestructible union composed of indestructible states, India is an indestructible union of destructible states. What do I mean by destructible states? It means that we can decide to have more states, we can decide to have less states, but the union is indestructible. The states in that sense have been described as being destructible. Now, what's the institutional mechanism which was visualized at the time of the independence for this broad objective? Broadly speaking, fiscal federalism represents stability in the process and procedures. The annual budgetary processes of both the central and the federal governments are independent exercises and have to go through parliament or the state legislature, as the case might be. The Finance Commission was first constituted in 1951 under Article 280 of the Indian Constitution, which has an unbroken legacy. It performs a very important function described in Article 280 of the Constitution. Which, which reads as, and it's important enough that I quote directly from the Constitution, and I quote from the Constitution, it says that the President, within two years from the commencement of this Constitution, thereafter, of every fifth year, of such a particular time, the President considers by what the finance commission, which has rise, and quote, other member uh, it shall be the duty of the commission to make recommendations to the president to the distribution of revenues between the union and the states of the net proceeds of taxes which are to be or may be divided under the chapter and the allocation of this between the states of the respective shares of such proceeds the principles of which shall govern the grants in aid of the revenues of the states out of the Consolidated Fund of India and any other matter which may be referred by the President to the Finance Commission in the interest of sound finance. The Commission shall determine its own procedures of work and be governed by the laws which are there. Now, for most of the post-independence era, we know that the Planning Commission existed. This is the 15th Finance Commission. There have been 14 Finance Commissions earlier. Not too many, because uh, unlike many other offices and so on, this is a very finite thing. This is the 15th uh, Finance Commission, of which I'm privileged to be the, the its chairman. And that when the Planning Commission existed, uh, this was always regarded as a bit of an irritant in the Finance Commission performing its essential function. Because while the Finance Commission concentrated on the revenue resources, the Planning Commission was concentrated on the capital expenditure. Successive Finance Commission had adversely commented on the limits of its functioning, given the functions of the Planning Commission. Subsequently, there was only one more important change, namely that Article 73rd and 74th of the Constitution, in which the status was given to Panchayati Raj, urban local bodies, and what is now known as the third tier of the Constitution. As a coordinating entity, two key institutions heard, namely the National Development Council, constituted in 1952, oversee the work of the and the formation of the Interstate Council by a constitutional amendment in 1990, 
on the basis of the recommendations of the Sarkaria Commission. Now, in the changing paradigm of center-state relations, let us refer to a few important issues. The first and foremost, I refer to the issue of the future or the seventh schedule of the Constitution. What is the seventh schedule of the Constitution? The seventh schedule of the Constitution divides the functions in three categories. In category one, in list one, those functions which are primarily in the domain of the union, in list two, which are primarily in the domain of the states, and in list three, which is called the concurrent list, in which is in the domain of both, both can enact legislations, except that the central government legislation, if enacted, will prevail over other state level legislation. Apart from other changes, one of the things which has, of course, happened is that uh, in an amendment introduced in the Constitution in 1975, it decided to shift some subjects from the state list to the concurrent list. These classically include uh, issues of uh, classically include issues of forest and education from the state to the concurrent list. There has always been a proliferation of uh, standalone legislations by parliament, subjects which many view are in the domain of state. What are some of these standalone legislations? Let me give you three examples. First and foremost, the Mahatma Gandhi National Rural Employment Guarantee Act of 2005. The Right of Children to Free and Compulsory Education Act of 2009. Earlier, and a little later, the National Food Security Act of 2013. Now here, there is the classic dichotomy. The dichotomy between the use of what many people and fiscal analysts call the misuse of Article 282 of the Constitution. Now what does the Article 282 of the Constitution says? I quote from that Article 282 of the Constitution. It says, the union or the state may make any grants, any public purpose, notwithstanding that the purpose is not one in respect to which parliament or the legislature of the state, as a case may be, may make laws." I unquote. What is the implication of this? The implication of this is clearly that it doesn't matter whether it is in list one, in list two, or in list three, that Grants can be given under Article 282, which will supersede in a way in which category the subject belongs. In itself, this, of course, may not have made a fundamental difference, but where it makes a decisive difference is that most of the centrally sponsored schemes, and all of you, I'm sure, must have heard of what centrally sponsored schemes are, and their numbers are quite large, have been done under the guise Article 282 of the Constitution. These centrally sponsored schemes, which all of you know, and quite a few of them in the domain of the states. And these centrally sponsored schemes uh, involve substantial expenditure. Efforts to rationalize these centrally sponsored schemes have remained uh, somewhat sterile with very limited system. Now, I think the Finance Commission will break you. Of found that there are 211 such schemes, 29 sub-schemes under a broad umbrella of uh, roughly, as I said, 29 schemes. Uh, these centrally sponsored schemes cost the central government 3.232 lakh crores per annum. And considering that the states are really a party to the centrally sponsored schemes, it also costs the state depending on the proportionality, roughly, uh, uh, slightly, sometimes slightly more, sometimes slightly less than 3.32 lakh crores. Together, between the expenditure of the center and the states, they add up close to 6 to 7 lakh crores. So, the issue arises that these centrally sponsored schemes 
importantly continue to grow, far from shrinking. In classic examples recently is Ayushman Bharat, the Jal Jeevan Mission, enhancing the reach and diversity of these centrally sponsored schemes. Now, why are some of these things very significant now? And why am I raising some of these things now? This is because I believe that therefore in theory and in practice, the vision which prompted our forefathers to give this constitutional demarcation of functions between the center and the states stands substantially modified, if not obliterated by the existence of these centrally sponsored schemes. They are therefore in a certain sense, strong departure from the centrally sponsored schemes. Think of almost any subject. Health, I've come to the issues of health, uh, classic state subject, employment, classic state subject, education, classic state subject, but there are centrally sponsored schemes. So the clutter, or what I call the clutter of the centrally sponsored schemes spreads over a wide canvas, therefore makes the distinction to what belongs to states, what belongs to center, highly opaque one. And this leads to inherent constitutional dichotomy, if not in friction. Now this was recognized quite some time. So uh, in 1971, a committee called the Raja Mannar Committee, Raja Mannar incidentally was a very eminent person he was connected with the one of the finance commissions in its earlier incarnation. Now, he had headed a committee uh, on center state relations inquiry committee. And he had recognized that by 71, the clutter of the centrally sponsored schemes had already uh, made the entire, uh, entire uh, regime somewhat opaque. So he suggested, as part of the finding, and I quote, that it is desirable to constitute a high-powered commission consisting of lawyers, jurists, and elderly statesmen with administrative experience to examine the entries of list one and list three of the seventh schedule of the constitution and suggest the redistribution of the entries. This same sentiment was expressed a little later by the Punchi Committee report headed by Justice Punchi, which recommended in 2010 that we need to begin a more robust consultation process on the seventh schedule between the center and the states. This is also articulated in the group which was constituted to look and review the working of the constitution. So I think that the basic theme remains that unless this clutter and unless this opaqueness and this incongruence between the application of the seventh schedule, Article 282 of the Constitution is cleaned up between the application of Article 282 and the seventh schedule of the Constitution is cleaned up. Fiscal architecture, as we go forward, will remain clumsy and ill-designed to suit the contemporary needs. Why do I use the word contemporary needs and contemporary challenges? What I have in mind is that technology has changed, electoral expectations have changed, the aspirations have changed, the obligations of national leaders have changed, and if you strictly went by the application of the seventh schedule, let me give you an example. Is it reasonable that the Prime Minister of India visits a drought stricken district in Bihar or in Maharashtra. And looking at the drought condition, there is a popular sentiment that in order to ease the drought, they need drinking water. Should the prime minister say, look here, I don't deal with drinking water. This is in the seventh schedule, a subject of the state. Would that be a reasonable conduct? Looking at today's times, looking at the fact that the electoral is not, electorate is not particularly interested to whom this subject belongs to. 
the electorate is interested in finding out what prime minister can do to ameliorate the distress on drinking water, on, on drought, on the pandemic, on any floods, and any relief which they want. They are not too interested. So this is where I believe that that is the other reason why in today's contemporary times, we need to revisit the entries which were made at that time in the seventh schedule of the Constitution. And this is the compelling need of what today's electoral politics, not only in India, but all over the world. And this is something which you have mentioned, I brought out rather clearly in my autobiography. Ask myself the rhetorical question that has the world and has India become increasingly authoritarian, sent ecocentric, investing huge confidence in the central leadership. This is not an act of a conscious decision. People in the United Kingdom, which is the mother of parliamentary democracy, and the Westminster model is still touted as the best model which we know of parliamentary democracy. I'm not talking in terms of a presidential form of government, but even in a parliamentary democracy, of which the mother country quoted is the is the United Kingdom. When people vote, do they vote for Prime Minister Johnson or do they worry about the fact of who his minister might be, to whom the subject belongs, and so on. When people vote, for instance, in Canada, which is again not a presidential form of government, uh, do people vote of who the Prime Minister would be or do they vote? really, of what the expectations are. When people of France vote, the presidential form of government just becomes even starker. That they vote who the presidential candidate is. Is it Macron? Or who is it? Not necessarily what the sub-national governments, the mayors in France would be. When people vote in a good working federation like the United States, which has good governors and powerful governors of individual states. Do they vote for the presidential candidate? or do they vote of who the likely governor is going to be. Therefore, whatever may be the tenets, whatever may be the prescription, fact remains that the world is increasingly looking at the dominant political leadership. And if any distribution of functions have been done at the time when the Constitution was written in 1951 or earlier, and the demarcation of the functions were done at that time, in my view, that demarcation deserves fundamental rethink and a fundamental revisit. There are two other issues, and I'll stop there. One issue, is the theme of today's lecture, is pandemic and resetting the federal context. Now, we know when it comes to pandemic, the issue naturally arises that is it the function of the state or is it the function of the central government? Now, here, we, all of us know that there is the Disaster Management Act of 2005. Earlier, there is the Epidemic Act, which is much earlier. So a lot of what is being done for the management of the pandemic is by the use of both the Epidemic Act, which existed much before the Constitution was framed, and the Disaster Management Act. There is some incongruity in the, in the definition and to whom the centrality of the functions belong. And I think that one of the things which we need to do is clean this clutter up also and bring the the practice more uniformly, which will define really uh, the issues that, which the National Epidemic Act should do as compared to the issues which have done by the Disaster Management Act. But let me say this, that unlike other countries, unlike the United States, which is also facing a COVID, India has record has been a far more credible one 
and a more harmonious management of the dynamics of center state polity. While the initial leadership was given in the first phases of this COVID crisis, it has subsequently evolved. Much more has been assigned to the domain of the states. And the states are increasingly shouldering the responsibility. Will there be a lockdown in my capital? Will I bring other, other parts of my state as part of the containment zone? When should I lift it? Should I have a curfew? Should I not have a curfew? What is the best way to contain the growth of this pandemic? So I think that India has notwithstanding the clutter which I have described at some length between the National Disaster Management Act and the Epidemic Act, which dates back to the pre to the earlier period, uh, I think that our record in practice on the management of the federal polity has been a more credible one than the record of, let us say, the governor of New York constantly complaining failure of the president in the management of the COVID for the state of New York. I find that we have done it in practice, notwithstanding the clutter of the various acts and strategies. Last point. Clearly, the finances of the states are in distress. The revenues have fallen. Central government's own revenues have fallen. There are issues of fiscal pressure. I do believe that this is a time of accommodation. This is a time when I believe that some of the, the basic tenets of the fiscal norms need to be suitably relaxed. This is a time states need greater room to be able to meet the additional obligations on account of this pandemic. This is a time when we need to revisit the entire issue of macroeconomic stability. Different perspective. Perspective of this pandemic, this path is unknown, and remains a guessing game, and its consequences in the economy remain exceedingly problematic. So as I can come to the last part, making some concluding observations, let me say that there are issues of the short term. There are issues of the longer term. The longer term, as we emerge from the pandemic, we must address the issues which are germane and on which I have dealt with some length, named the cleaning up of the clutter of the seventh schedule by an appropriate national consensus on how looking at today's compulsions, expectations of both the people, expectations of the electorate, expectation of the entire political orbit, what technology can give, need to redefine those seven schedules demarcating the functions which have out, long outlived its utility. These are the long-term issues. In the short run, as I said, there is an issue of dealing with the clutter of the Disaster Management Act and the Epidemic Act. They need to have greater harmony between the two. And the very immediate run, giving states greater fiscal space and a greater ability to meet their inescapable expenditure obligations. It's not easy to speak uh, on a subject like this on evolution of uh, federal fiscal architecture. There is a legacy. There is a history. We need to be consistent. We need not to be in here in con contradiction of the tenets of the forefathers of our constitution. That for a working federation, both the center and the states need to act. Concert harmony and the spirit which furthers the basic objective of the Constitution to improve life quality citizens.
wherever in India, those in the states, those under the control of the government. Thank you very much for this opportunity to share some ideas and some thoughts which I have for the future of the fiscal framework and the fiscal architecture which we have dealt with the history and dealt with the contemporary challenges both in the short run and the long run. Thank you very much for this opportunity and I'm happy to answer any questions, uh, any comments or any queries which any of you have. Thank you very much. Thanks, yeah, uh, thank you so much, sir. Uh, I would now request Shivangi uh, to just, I mean, uh, enable anybody who who wants to ask a question? I mean, uh, people would have typed some question uh, in the chat box, so you can pick up some questions from there. Uh, to begin with, uh, it was wonderful hearing your insights. Uh, we have a few questions from the participants. Uh, the first question is from Mr. Sankalp. He wants to know uh, what is your view on making the Finance Commission a permanent financial advisory body. What would be its pros and cons? First of all, uh, since I head the present Finance Commission, it will hardly be appropriate that uh, for me to suggest whether we should be a self-perpetuating body or uh, we should be a body which finishes its work, work and then walks away. Uh, but uh, the literature on this uh, all over the world has suggested three things. First, uh, let's go by the example of some of the other uh, similar federal entities. Let me take the example of the Australian federal entity. Uh, now, there is the Australian Grants Commission, which uh, more or less performs the similar functions as the Indian Finance Commission. And the Australian Grants Commission is a permanent body and helped by also the Expenditure Commission. The two work in tandem looking at expenditure outcomes of the various provinces and keep calibrating the grants which they give to the states. So that's that's the dynamic point in which it's a permanent commission, they recalibrate. The Indian experience is that if you keep doing that, uh, the, the flip side of it, you inject a degree of uncertainty and unpredictability on the likely availability of resources, which we will leave behind for the union, and the unpredictability of the resources which we leave behind for the different states. The advantage, therefore, of giving the five-year award to do is the degree of stability and predictability uh, for that five-year period. Now, the question is a legitimate one, that what happens if we give it for five years, things go wrong, let us say the second year, there is no recourse mechanism. There is no recourse mechanism because the only recourse is for the next finance commission to be able to reset that part of the story. So you get boxed in to awards given uh, on certain assumptions, which time may prove uh, not to be valid for the for the longer period. So, uh, so that is the flip side. Uh, the good side is it offers a degree. Similarly, South Africa, which is another uh, federal entity, has also a permanent finance commission of this nature. Some countries have a permanent secretariat, but uh, not necessarily a permanent finance commission. Uh, we have opted uh, for a finance commission to be appointed every five years. And so far in the last uh, 15 finance commissions, this has worked. But I, I agree that the challenges are serious because there is much greater volatility and unpredictability given technology and other changes. And given the fact that the world is becoming increasingly more and more interdependent, uh, take the pandemic. It didn't begin in India. Uh, we were the recipients of the pandemic. Pandemic began somewhere else. So an interdependent world injects uncertainty and volatility. And this, therefore, would... Uh, uh, be it also an argument in favor of what Sankal is suggesting. So there are arguments, uh, Shivangi, on both sides of it, and I have just articulated the position. Sir, the next question is from Naren and Puneet, sir. Uh, they want to know, how can we address the growing dissent of states that contribute more to the revenue 
to the union, but they receive less. So should we have a performance oriented allocation? Can we as a union afford complete decentralization, giving states autonomy? And if yes, how can how can the states get, get more autonomy in generating more resources in their arena? Complex question. Uh, because there are many questions embedded in one question. Now, first and foremost, uh, the issue of decentralization and autonomy uh, and the performance uh, uh, issue which, uh, which he has raised. On the decentralization issue, let me uh, give a little explanation of what it is. So when we make the award, we do it in two parts. We do it in uh, part one, which is whatever we give to the union, which is therefore the central government has it. Then in the horizontal, we give a certain amount for the states. So whatever we give to the states based on a formula which we give to the states, those are totally autonomous as far as those states are concerned. There's no conditions which are attached. So they have a total autonomy in regard to funds which they get from that amount, which is devolved to them on, based on our horizontal firm. Now, issue which you said on the performance orientation is this, that is our horizontal formula a perfect match to a performance devolution? Right? So I'll let me give you an example. Let me say that would it be fair, after all, one of the basic tenets of public finance is that people of India, irrespective of where they are, are entitled more or less the same levels of goods and services as people of any other part of India. Right? One of the parameters by which this equity consideration is reflected is based on levels of development and levels of per capita income. Now, I can understand the argument that parts of parts of India have not really progressed as rapidly as other parts of India. And it's too legitimate for those parts of India to raise the issue for how long should we act as a subsidy box parts of India which have not grown so fast. Now, would that, uh, that's the logic. And I can see that logic. On the other hand, uh, states in India, particularly the more populous states, I mean the heartland states, Uttar Pradesh, or Bihar, Rajasthan, and so on, uh, 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 their population stabilization is a little far away as compared to the population stabilization achieved by some of the southern states. So the issue, the big controversy there which you must be aware of, Puneet must be aware of, is what census data uh, should the Finance Commission use? Should we use the census data of 1972 or 71, which was being done for a long time? Should we use the census data of uh, 2011? Even that is out of date because the 2021 data is still uh, to be published perhaps next year after uh, we have given our award. So what census data should we so the argument of some of the states is that please use the 71 data because that will then reward us for the improvements we have made in demographic management, right? The argument of some of the less developed states is that look here, using that data does not do a justice because after all, the resources are to be used for whom? For the people of my state. If I have so many more people the per capita development expenditure is significantly lower. And if you are to give equal goods and services to every citizen of India, then you need to balance the considerations of equity with the considerations of efficiency. The challenge, therefore, of every finance commission is how do you harmonize equity with efficiency and compassion justice, fair play in recognizing the problems of the not so developed states while rewarding the 
greater performance for some of the other states. And this is a challenge which every finance commission grapples with. We are grappling with this. There is no unique answer. There is no magic bullet. It's a use ultimately or whether we do it by using our reason or whether we do it by excessive use or discretion, how transparent is it? We'll stop there. So the next question is from Mr. Rajeshwar Singh. He wishes to know, with the GST collections being low, the budget of ministries have been cut. There is definitely a need to boost the demand, demand side policies. And it's certain that we can't address all the policies, all the problems. So what are going to be our priorities and which are our important issues at this time? So since he raised the issue very directly, uh, Rajeshwar raised the issue of the, of the GST. Uh, there is no doubt that the, there has been uh, a decline in the realization from the GST. This is true of the CGST and the SGST also. States have also suffered because they have, uh, whatever they are likely to get is less than what they have expected to get, both as a share of the CGST and as a share of what the SGST they will get. Now, that the GST revenues have fallen short of what expectations were uh, is understandable because if, if the GDP has slowed down, then tax buoyancy is a function of nominal GDP. And if nominal GDP has come down, then clearly this will be reflected in much uh, smaller quantum of what will be realized both by direct and indirect taxes. And indirect tax, the, 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 the big tax is the, is the GST, and therefore there would be a sluggishness in the GST. So uh, as we go forward, it, a lot of the recovery on the GST would depend upon how quickly uh, data on Q3 and Q4 for the current year, 2021, pick up, uh, may not make up on the loss. I, I don't expect the sales uh, nominal GDP numbers to look uh, particularly happy or healthy one, but the expectations are that uh, as the recovery is getting intensified from whatever data we have seen, anecdotal and otherwise, um, there will be a sharp recovery in Q3 and Q4. And as you go to the next year, apart from 2021, considering that the nominal GDP numbers for 2021 will be subdued, there will be a rebound effect. And I expect the following year, uh, the nominal GDP numbers to, to look much healthier. The issue is whether this is monotonically a correction for the low base, which it may have this year, or is it a sustained one? Now, um, opinion is divided on that one. It would be fair to say that uh, it would be a combination of the two but in the meantime, we certainly hope that the effects of several important economic reforms which have been undertaken, uh, these economic reforms include the reform of the GST itself, some of which are in the, in the offing, uh, and some of the other growth, structural growth measures which have been taken, will in the medium term uh, take India closer to its growth potential. So as far as we are concerned, since we are looking at a five-year horizon, we are looking at India being able to reach its growth potential in a five-year time frame. The last question uh, which arises from Rajeshwar's question is the question that what happens in the meantime to finances of the states? Namely, that it, there was a 14% guarantee on the GST return on a certain tax year. Will this 14% be available to them or will this not be available? Now, the law as it stands today, that 14% return comes to an end June 21. The law as it stands today, uh, up to 20, June 21, would be applicable to all states unless the law is amended, uh, uh, which is unlikely, and amended retrospectively is even more unlikely. Then the issue will be what happens to, uh, since the uh, compensation payment, compensation says, is out of the accruals on the says. If the accruals on the says are inadequate to meet what would be the legacy uh, unpaid liability, which has been estimated by some, by in the region of six to seven lakh crores, how 
whether the central government intend to meet this. Now, the GST Council is grappling with this issue, but it will be a reasonable assumption that they will not be resigning from what is something their statutory obligations, and that whether over a period of time they will be in a position to extinguish this liability uh, by the continuation of the mechanism of access. The, sh the sharing, the 14% will end on June 2021, uh, subject to any other decision that the GST Council might take, which is cannot be second guessed. But the liability up to that point uh, will be no doubt discharged, either up exactly on that point or spread over a period. But that it will be discharged uh, would be uh, would be something uh, uh, which on which uh, the states have legitimate reasons to believe that there would be no resigning from statutory and legal obligations. Thank you so much, sir. So the next question is from Mr. Rahul Oja. He 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 has this thought. Considering the leakages and seepages in the policy implementation to the last mile, will something similar to another 73rd, 74th Amendment Act help us in any way? So you mentioned about the leakages from uh, particularly the 73rd and the 74th Amendment. Now saying that um, uh, we have visited all the states and we find uh, we have also had consultations with the third tier which is where the 33rd Amendment comes in, 73rd and 74th, namely the urban local bodies, the, the panchayats and, and the uh, middle tier. We find that there is a mixed picture on whether all the functions, the three Fs, functions, finance, and functionaries have been genuinely transferred or not. It's a mixed picture. Before we hold a third tier accountable, answerable, the first thing is whether the states have transferred the three Fs of functions, functionary, and finance. So it's a, it's a mixed picture. The second issue is that uh, how would have the third tier been in their implementation? Now, it's again a mixed picture. If you go to some states, like uh, I went to some panchayats in, in Kerala and I was really terrifically impressed at the way in which meticulously they have gone about it. I've been to other, uh, surprisingly, in some of the northeastern states, the panchayats are also doing well, but it's a mixed picture. Uh, and uh, on the picture of implementation and on the picture of planning. Why I said about functionally, is that the functionaries are also linked uh, with the quality of implementation. Many panchayats or groups of panchayats have complained to me and my colleagues uh, that we do not have civil engineer. We do not have people who can do the uh, a technical plan. We do not have uh, people who, who, who know basic accountancy. So issues of functionaries are as important as a transfer of functions. Let me say this, that we must give the 73rd and 74th uh, a much bigger scope and a much bigger opportunity than we have done so far. One of the things I'm very keen on is that, uh, taking the example of this pandemic, to assign to the third tier a much more coherent and responsible role in the health systems at the municipal levels, at the panchayat levels, and at the village levels. Before we come to any hasty conclusion against the seventh, against the third tier, I think we must give them, uh, we must assign all the powers and the finance, state finance commissions, uh, which are supposed to uh, work in tandem to be able to give the necessary financial support. It's also been a mixed picture. And many of these uh, have come to depend almost exclusively on the finances being devolved by the Finance Commission, which is really cast and not being exactly, uh, not being exactly appropriate to what the Constitution expects. With expect the State Finance Commission, whose primary obligation is to, because technically we need not give any money because the Constitution says, uh, Shivangi, that all that it says is that the 
Finance Commission would suggest ways to augment the consolidated fund of the state for enabling it to give uh, uh, greater resources to the third tier. But they haven't done it. And over a period of time, uh, after this enactment of this, they have come to increasingly depend the finances provided by the Finance Commission. So I think that there are, it's, it's a complex, a complex, uh, myriad set of issues, but there are no simple answers. But let me conclude that we this part of the question that we must give the third tier uh, in letter and in spirit the flexibility and the freedom and the autonomy. I think that, that will be a reasonable way forward. So, sir, the next question is from Mr. Amit. Uh, he is saying India is already under the market slowdown. Uh, in such a scenario, how is fiscal federalism going to save states like Bihar, uh, who are dependent on alcohol, which is banned, and stamp duty, which is very low in such states? First of all, I said earlier that in respect of the GST, uh, the bulk of the revenues come from CGST and SGST. There are the coverage of the GST does not include all subjects which you correctly point out. The three things which are outside, which is the important one, electricity duty, damp duty, duty on petroleum, and excise. You mentioned about prohibition, uh, which is part of the Thing which would have come, uh, which would have uh, been with the excise. Now, this issue goes beyond revenue because, uh, whereas clearly uh, by having a prohibition policy, there would be issues of whether it's working satisfactorily, it's not working satisfactorily, what is the quality of the enforcement, uh, what is the immediate revenue which you lose uh, as compared to the fact that, uh, particularly in rural India, uh, would this have a change in habits? Uh, would health parameters improve? Women's participation improve? Uh, that has a call which has been taken by the leadership that the balance of advantage lies in improving uh, the quality of life uh, if, uh, uh, the if prohibition is practiced, particularly in rural India. And the disempowerment of women and children uh, in the not being able to, a lot of the income, the bread earner goes in alcohol, uh, then frankly speaking, uh, there are uh, anecdotal stories which I'm sure Shivangi, all of us are aware of. Uh, then, of course, the stamp duty. Yes, it's uh, not the main source of, of revenue. So would not also be the petroleum thing, which is subject, of course, to so taxes. And, uh, 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 of course, one area which states, I think, have not harnessed their revenue strongly urge them to do so. It's property tax. Property tax is one of the most neglected areas of taxation. They are being undertaxed. They are being inadequately taxed. They have been wrongly valued. There are no benchmarks on property tax. And certainly, I can assure uh, Amit that the Finance Commission is, is actively engaged in this issue of property taxes. But uh, ultimately, Growth will come from state growth and national growth, which will improve the main source of revenue, which will improve really uh, the, the, the gains from CGST and SGST both going up as the national economy picks up. So, sir, uh, we'll wrap up our question and answer uh, uh, with this last uh, question that Guru Raj uh, wishes to ask. He wants to ask, uh, what are your thoughts and comments on the universal basic income? Let me say that uh, I'm not a strong votary of universal basic income. I know the literature of it. Uh, I know people have argued. So uh, all over whether India has reached. The reason is this. First of all, the most important is the fiscal issue. You cannot have a universal basic income 
if you continue with all other forms in which the incomes are being supplemented. Uh, and it have, for instance, subsidized food, PDS, where PDS is also adding saving or income, where you are getting the issue price of the food grains is significantly lower than the issue price, uh, uh, then really the, the market price at which uh, food grains are available. So that's a subsidy to give an example. Fertilizers, we are continuing to give fertilizer to farmers in a, in a very subsidized way. Uh, that's, uh, that is an outgo from, 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 the, from, the, from the consolidated fund. You are giving uh, uh, relief on electricity. Many parts of India, agricultural electricity, uh, uh, realization is next to zero. Electricity in some parts of India are free. So there are multiple ways in which there is already a state intervention in which you are giving a subsidy. If you wish to move towards straight away universal basic income, for instance, I think that uh, what has been done in the case of PDS is during the pandemic itself, the period in which for which you are giving the uh, certain quantum of uh, uh, um, rice or wheat and then dal got added. Uh, was a limited period. That period got extended up to November. Uh, uh, and the coverage got extended to a much larger segment, including uh, people who are migrants. And also the fact that one nation, one ration card, means that the entitlement which it has accrued on uh, the access to food is uh, all India access. And if you don't draw it in, let us say, Zafarpur in Bihar, to give an example, but you are working in, let us say, in Delhi or Mumbai, uh, the undrawn amount you can draw here. So already there is a very substantial coverage. So some e economists have argued, like uh, uh, my good friend Abhijit Sen and Esther, uh, that uh, why not then make it a universal public distribution system in which you do, do away with this classification? It can be considered. But my short answer is, that no matter how romantic the quest of a universal basic income looks, you must look at holistically that if you adopt that, you must, cannot have that, plus all the existing subsidy outgo, uh, which, is, uh, uh, which is currently happening, some of which I, I described to you, uh, water, fertilizer, electricity, public distribution system. If all this is, is clubbed together and given up in some form, of course, there would be a very strong, uh, strong case to move towards uh, uh, a universal basic income, which many Nordic countries have moved and, would be, and many countries have moved towards. But you cannot have both uh, looking at the stressed out uh, finances, which any government at any point in time will do. Now, you want to really visit the entire idea of social contract uh, as what are the obligations of the state. The entire issue, issue of uh, revisiting the social contract is a much larger issue. And whether universal basic income should form a part of the literature and the analytics of uh, social contract being revisited is, of course, a, a complex uh, analytical issue. And there can always be two sides of the same coin. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir, for sharing such insights. Uh, if there are any other questions, uh, uh, we're very sorry. We were not able to take that up. Uh, I would now like to hand over to Mr. Amrit. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, let me tell you, this is the first, I mean, this is the inaugural talk in our public policy talk series here in the IM Bangalore, organized by the Center for Public Policy uh, by the students of the batch of uh, TGPPM batch of 2021. And we are indeed, uh, I mean, very kind of you that you kindly consented and you spared some time from your busy schedule to speak on such a topic. Fiscal federalism is such a vast topic, such a, I mean, it cannot be spoken in just one hour and all the dynamics of the topic to be explained in one hour is a very difficult task. But sir, you have touched upon almost all the important points right from the evolution, uh, going back to pre-independence days and post-independence and uh, be it the 
the issues related with the seventh schedule where you are talking about the clearing up the clutter and uh, of course now as we go into this covid situation uh, the role of uh, finance commission is even more greater and more challenging because as you say that the finance commission has to play a balancing role balancing role to say that there is a clamor for more funds on behalf of the states and there is an issue of the shrinking revenues so this balancing act has to be played by the finance commission and so sir uh, i think uh, there were some important questions also asked uh, relating to whether the commission should be made into a turned into a permanent body and uh, what about the states uh, uh, which are not doing so well on the development front being subsidized by the other states and uh, the lastly the question of universal basic income so i think uh, overall sir uh, be uh, because of few lot of points have been touched upon and covered in such a short time and uh, we are really very thankful to you for have kindly consented to deliver the talk thank you indeed sir thank you very much thank you very much